That's nine pounds of sugar I extracted out of a tree. Find out how I did it in this video. Hey guys, how's it going? So I'm here with uh, Holden. You wanted him to come back and do another video. So here we are. We're gonna do some maple, or well, we're gonna start some maple sy uh, syrup sap deal. I'm gonna show you the materials that we're using. Basically it's a, I like the traditional spiles, metal spile. Um, it's basically got a slit at the back. You uh, tap that into the tree after you make a hole and we're gonna rig it onto the tree with just a little nail here. Um, they do sell buckets special made for doing maple sap. I don't particularly like them because they're expensive and these ones I can get for free at the grocery store. So basically I go to the uh, bakery section and they'll sometimes if you're lucky we'll have a, a, a bunch of empty pails. Wash those out. So you drill a little hole on the side here with a spade bit, punch through that. And then what you're gonna do is hang it onto the tree like so, through your hole, punch it in, and then use the nail on the inside to hold it in. So for that, so we got the spile, the nail, right? And a hammer, hammer to tap the spile into the tree. You don't have to go in super far into the tree, but far enough just to hold this on. I find actually that this spile tapped into the tree is, is good enough to hold an entire bucket full. The next thing we do is wait. Uh, it'll take probably two, two days or so to fill up a bucket like that. If it's on a good run, it might take a day. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna do, I think we have about 20 buckets to do, uh, 20 to 40 buckets, somewhere in there, so probably about 30. You do want to make sure that when you get your buckets, you keep the lids. You don't want these to fill up with rainwater because that's going to make it, your, your solution a lot more dilute. The ratio we're looking at is about 40 to 1. So 40 pails of, of uh, sap will boil down to one pail of maple syrup. That's about the ratio that you have going. So you can imagine if you want to make a lot of syrup, you need a lot of sap. My idea this time is I'm going to do one big boil if I can. The temperatures uh, are such that it, uh, sap will run at any temperature above zero degrees. If it doesn't go below zero at night, means it won't flow the next day. So, the, and the greater the differential between night and day, the greater the flow. So obviously you want warm days and cold nights. And then if it becomes uh, such that the temperature doesn't fluctuate between cold and warm, or, z or below is freezing and above freezing, the sap stops flowing and there becomes a time where later on in the season the sap becomes more bitter than uh, sweet. So you kind of have to call it quits at some point, but you can get a pretty good run, maybe three, four weeks. So let's get some going, right bud? All right, so that's it. We're gonna do a big boil after. So all we're gonna do is make a nice hole here and see the old hole from last year healed over. So we're just going on a sort of uphill angle so that the sap will flow outwards. You got a spile, lightly tap it in, pop them in like so. And then the nail's gonna fit in. It's pretty nice to have a little helper. I really do appreciate having my son come out and help. It's nice to have some company rather than doing like purely sur solo survival kind of deals all the time. But this isn't really solo, or this isn't really survival, but it is more homesteading. And it's something that fits into wilderness living, that's for sure. Thanks, buddy. All right, man, what do you notice about the gut pile? It's completely gone. <laughs> that's weird, eh? So. I was kind of wondering what was going on with the gut pile, why it was still here for so long, but we had really super cold temperatures for a long time, and then what happened over the last week? It got a lot warmer. It got a lot warmer. So now the gut pile was here. There was actually not one gut pile, but two gut piles from two yeah. different goats, right? Remember how big it was and how smelly it was? Yeah, it smelled really bad. It smelled really bad. Anyway, so, and you can actually see, it looks like there's animals, like, can you see, like, they're pulling at this too? Can you see that? Like everything's kind of like being pulled down. So probably an animal is jumping up and trying to pull the little bits of fat off there. 
But the, that gut pile that was here is completely gone. It's and completely. it was huge. It was like this big. Yeah, it was like this big. It was a, it was two big gut piles, so it's gone. It's too bad I didn't have the trail camera on it, but I did bring it up north with me, so. I guess it's going to be a mystery of what animals took it, but this is just a, a lesson for you guys to understand that even if you don't use the whole animal, nature will re-consume absolutely everything and incorporate it back into nature. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Nothing's ever wasted. Waste, waste is, a, is a human term. Mmm, sweet. There's so much in here already. We've just been letting it drip while we tap the other trees. It's like a centimeter high. It's probably more than that. It looks like there's almost an inch in there. Super sweet or just a little bit sweet? A little. A does little it, sweet. Does it taste like maple syrup? No. No? Not even close. Not even close. Gotta boil it down, right? Yeah. Yeah. For so like a really, a oh, really long time. You put the lid back on? So it's been about four days since I set these out. I'm just coming to double check, see what's going on. Uh, the weather, as you can see, is not really cooperating. We're back to snow. Um, as I mentioned before, the temperatures have to go above zero in order for the sap to run. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to collect some of the buckets that are more on the full side so they don't overflow. And I'm going to get my boiling system ready. To boil, I have a large vat <clears throat> and I have some rescued bricks. So what we're going to do is prop up the vat from a, it's an old commercial sink, I believe, from a restaurant. We're gonna prop that up on the rocks and we're gonna make a nice uh, enclosure so that we can feed wood in. I did this system, same system last year and it worked really well. It's not as good as having a wider vat with a bigger fire underneath and more surface area, but it does work. So for our purpose, it'll do just fine and I only plan to do one big boil this year because I still have maple syrup from last year and maple sugar. So for anybody you don't know, this is like my actual brother, Jeremy. Everybody thinks that Jeremy's my brother, but Jeremy's just a buddy from high school. Although we look alike, this is my actual brother. His name's Kevin. Hi. <laughs> he was asking me if I was going to eat this. Inside here is a little bit of maple syrup from last year. And I actually am going to eat it. Sweet. Tastes just like maple syrup. It's kind of funny that maple syrup would actually last in the bottom of that container. It's probably not maple syrup when we left it, but it had probably evaporated uh, throughout the year, just sitting as water in the heat. And so most of the water evaporated, and what was left is um, maple sugar, maple syrup, actually. So there you go. And uh, tastes just as fresh as it was the day uh, we made it. Want some bean? Nope. <laughs> bean didn't want it, but good stuff.
quad bricks in the front here we'll have a little bit of a damper drafter deal back the back so the airflow and all that good stuff and then I'll brick up to the front as the fire gets going and then seal off that heat but, uh, pretty simple boiler system for us that's all we need so for some reason we got one that's almost three quarters of the way full but all the other ones are probably only about two inches and we'll empty this one in get a good start First day collection, we have the Suzuki modified for maple sap collection. So this is the 1.0 version. Actually, maybe a more advanced than that. It's the most efficient way to earn your calories collecting sap. Truthfully, we could probably just do it by hand, but you know, it's actually more fun this way. It's more of a family adventure. Hi. So we've got maybe one third buckets full. But tomorrow's gonna About, be a like, tomorrow's gonna be a hot day. Today's gonna be a hot day. Not me. Okay. These are road ones. Our road ones are a bit more productive. Let's see if I can get this open with one hand. It doesn't feel too full. Yeah, there's a little bit in there. How's about it look? A, about a quarter, but it's like turning to ice. Yeah, we'll get what we got. Hmm? We'll get what we got. Yeah. So that's almost a pail out of four pails, so not enough. But it's only the first day. We got a 40 to 1, so we need 40 buckets to make one bucket of syrup. So this is my second year doing maple syrup. Last year I did a lot. This year I'm not gonna do as much because last year was just basically an experiment. I was really focused on how many calories I could get from the production of maple syrup. But my focus was mainly on testing whether or not it was feasible for Native American people to boil and produce calories from maple sap and to maple sugar. I found that through my research, especially that that wasn't the case. Native Americans never actually uh, really produced maple syrup unquantity until the arrival of the Europeans and that's not common knowledge most people think that natives were pioneers when it came to maple syrup and that they had produced it and collected with birch bark containers and they did but they didn't do it until Europeans really came they might have used it in stews <clears throat> before then but you can imagine making a stew is a difficult thing when you didn't have a cast iron pot you know how would you boil water so uh, a lot of historical records mention that they would hollow out logs and drop in hot rocks and that would boil away very slowly the water to produce the syrup but what you don't understand was what people don't understand is that it would be filled with ash and it would be filled with grit to the point where you wouldn't actually want to eat it it would be sweet but you wouldn't really like it so a lot of people uh, are, have that misconception so Native Americans didn't actually do it the rival Europeans brought cast iron pots and they would boil it in quantity what they did was as part of the trade with Europeans is produce massive amounts of maple syrup because it was something they could trade for for traps, uh, for metal traps, uh, for guns, for ammunition, etc. So Native Americans never actually did it. Right? At least certainly not in quantity like, like we presume they did. So Europeans basically did it. People like us. And uh, they did it because they could employ uh, horses to, to pull the, the carts around to collect the sap and syrup. And uh, you know, to cut the firewood, they needed metal implements to cut enough firewood to burn off all that excess moisture. So we're just out here doing it for fun. It's a great way to collect nutrients from the environment, but it's more homesteading. So we got probably about that much in the bottom of that container. Uh, gonna collect a couple more times so that I have enough that it makes sense for me to boil it. It takes a lot of energy to heat this thing up. I'll go over that a little bit later. But to get it to temperature where it starts to boil is a lot of work. And uh, it's not something I wanna restart over and over again unless I had to. I don't know if you guys watch the trailer park boys with bubbles, but this is uh, this is our version of bubbles. So the wood ones here, 
in the shade and shelter are not producing it, only the street ones. These ones will produce later. Um, the good thing is they produce longer, but they produce later because they're sheltered and uh, they don't heat up as much with the sun because they don't hit the, get the sun as early as they do on the street. Really good. <laughs> Is it sweet? Yeah. A little bit or mostly or not at all? A little. A little. If you guys are all cooped up in the city, man, you got to get out here. Get out in the bush and get out in the country. And you know, as soon as those temperatures start to come up in the spring, it's a good time to get out. And the sun's out and you get, a, you get your vitamin D, you get your fill. Uh, you know, after being cooped up. This, this year I wasn't really cooped up. I did lots of trips and lots of adventures. So, I didn't feel like the summer, or the winter dragged on a lot this year. I felt like I got full potential of it. But uh, yeah, man, getting on the spring, you know, and just getting that sun on you again makes you feel so much better. You know, we weren't meant to be indoors, not at all. A couple years ago at my house, I used to have laying hen chickens. So my brother's, because he's got some property out here, he's making himself a little coop. This will be laying hen coop here. I think you'll have about seven or eight hens that'll produce enough eggs for him. I'll be able to steal a couple eggs every once in a while. And uh, we're actually going to get meat birds too. We're going to get 50, uh, 50 chicken meat birds. We're going to put them in a chicken tractor up by the field here where we had our Native American garden. And uh, that'll be good. So we'll have, you know, like good two chickens per month. So 25 chickens each. Native American garden. Uh, that's a work in progress. We've got a bead on some cow manure. So we're gonna throw some cow manure out in here. Our uh, goat manure actually from the goat farmer, <coughs> I think, and some cow manure possibly as well. We've got a little bit of a tarp experiment working. We haven't even put a lot of effort into the tarp, but hopefully we can get on top of the weed situation and uh, produce a lot more of the food that we want this year. So it's a big garden and uh, wasn't very successful last year. We did get quite a bit out of it, but uh, a lot of weeds and it was uh, quite of a, Quite a bit of work so we have to get it started once we get the system up and running we'll be fine we'll produce a lot of food we got a bunch of kindling and some scrap wood we're gonna throw in there but it's been unusually cold for uh for spring we haven't even had spring like weather so since we collected we got maybe one more collect right buddy yeah probably some of the buckets are still full mm-hmm it after we collect all that sap, it's probably going to be up to about here. Yeah, it might be totally full, eh? So we got to start boiling. Yep. The first part of the fire is always a smoky business because it's not enough heat to actually combust the wood. So we've, uh, and we're getting a lot of strong winds. So we set up a little bit of a barricade here. Just uh, some foam, you know, junk it up redneck style. And then there's a perforated other little meshy bit thing. Oh. But yeah, the smoke's terrible. So once we get, once that heat picks up, once the heat picks up in there, all that smoke will dissipate. So it's starting to right now. And then we'll have some really good heat. But the biggest problem today is going to be to get that block defrosted. Extra step today. But it's actually kind of worked in our benefit because uh, we've been able to collect for almost three weeks now. Although the flow hasn't been really good. Problem with uh, maple, si maple sap is that it only keeps for about two days or three days or four days, you know, maybe a week. I'll give it a week. Uh, but the higher the temperatures, the more likely it is to spoil. It's like sugar water. And you can imagine once you open, say, uh, you know, a bottle of Gatorade or something like that, introduce a little bit of bacteria in there, it, uh, it could start to spoil. So you only have a certain number of days. It's got a shelf life. But once it turns into maple syrup, you have a little bit more because it's been purified, it's um, been sterilized. So it has a longer shelf life, a couple, about a month or so is what they, what they say, but I know I've kept stuff in the fridge for a year and it's fine. 
Uh, as a maple sugar, it's got a probably year, two years. If it's probably stored, probably indefinitely as a shelf life. So that's what we're aiming for is to get that indefinite shelf life of, of the purified uh, maple sugar if we get that far, maple syrup at best. But uh, yeah, so we're in the early stages now. We're gonna get that block of ice melted, which is gonna take a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy on its own just to get it to boil from a liquid. My brother's a little bit of a nut for wood, if you can't tell. He uh, basically has a deal with the the uh, woodcutters, the tree pruners, etc., in the neighborhood. Well, I should say in the neighborhood. We're out in the country now, but you know, people need arborists work around. They need arborists to cut down the trees. So what he does is he says, "Okay, just drop it off in my house. I don't care what it is." So he takes all the refuse wood that they can't deal with. They just have way too much of it. See here, if you see the piles in behind me, all tarped off, um, miles and miles of it. And uh, he'll work away at it over the over the winter and over the spring and summer. Fills up all these bays here. And I'll uh, show you. So uh, my son Holland's helping uh, his uncle, Gavin, my brother, unload. And he's got this uh, boiler over here. They talk about homesteading. So he's got a boiler behind me here. It's uh, high efficiency, whatnot. So he boils outside here, and then it carries hot water into the house. So that gets piped into the house, heats the whole house. So he's basically heating the whole house for free. I mean, if you don't count all the labor he puts into it, which is a lot. Uh, moving this wood around, keeping everything going. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to save a bit of money, you want to live off the grid, that's one way to do it. You see the truck, you made some fancy modifications to a truck, bought the truck for 500 bucks. So that's a, you know, a substitute for, you know, ATV. 500 bucks get you a four wheel drive truck. You can't insure that sucker, but hey, there it goes. Some of you guys asked me about the old Suzuki. Well, this is the old Suzuki. This is what it does. It's a pickup truck. And then all the wood back here. And a whole nother bay. You see, packed everywhere. Wood everywhere. <laughs> oh, here, piles and piles of it. All back there, piles, 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 piles. Piles of wood. Yeah. Wood pile. Pile wood, non pile wood, burn wood. Look at it, all back here too. Wood, everywhere. Years, decades. So someone's gonna come steal my wood now, you're telling them all where it is. Nobody wants your wood. They better not take my wood. I'm not, I'm not taking any live trees, they're all dead. So if they're dead and they're gonna rot, you might as well take the rotting trees and burn them in order to not use fossil fuel pictures. That little box over there does the best of hot water, all the heat. And it's actually more efficient than an airtight wood insert, so. What do you think of that truck? Good. It's boiling good now. So I've replaced the front door with a slab. Uh, it was kind of, the bricks are burning through my mitts all the time. So I just replaced it with a slab and I can open and close the slab. So since we're rednecking it anyway, I do some hot dogs. I do some hot dogs redneck style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on to it. Yeah. Hang on. It's gonna roll off. It's not. Yeah, it's gonna roll off. It's gonna roll off. <laughs> Come on. You look kind of dumb when you eat. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, it smells good. Get a whiff of it? Oh, yeah, that smells so good. <laughs> smells like candy. We're just at a spot here where we cleaned our hair from our snowshoe hair snaring video. And how much is left here on the ground? Nothing. Nothing. The gut pile is all gone. And the head. And the head. The two heads and the, the cape, uh, the fur, all gone. So that was only a few days ago we did that, right? It's completely disappeared. So when people say, you know, stuff goes to waste or you're not eating anything, nothing goes to waste. If you just dump it in the bush, somebody's going to eat it, right? Yeah, let's show them what's got, what we got left. So here's the spot down below where most of the hair and blood fell. You can see where we had the hair tied up. I'll just leave that there just in case we get another animal. And we had tossed the capes, the heads, back here. And I'm sure if we went far back enough, we might see where an animal crushed the heads. But I don't see them right here. But an animal will usually, when they find something like that or scavenge something like that, they don't like to eat it out in the open. So what they do is drag it off uh, back in the bush where they feel safe and then they'll start eating it there. We're nearly through. Uh, I kind of lost track of how many buckets we put in. I know we started with maybe that much, let's say. That's about a foot or so. And then we maybe added another foot. It's really hard to tell. Uh, so I'm, right now I'm watching or monitoring what's happening with the sap. With a, a stick, I just kind of measure down. Um, what I want to make sure is I don't over boil. If I over boil, it completely ruins the syrup. What happens is it crystallizes and it starts to turn into the sugar. I may actually just completely turn this in, this whole batch into sugar just to see roughly how much I can get out of it. It's more readily stored. And I, I frankly, I don't need any more syrup. I still have quite a bit of syrup that I froze from last year, so I don't need any more. All I'm doing now is checking to see that it doesn't overboil. What happens with the sap is once it gets near syrup, what it starts to do is it starts to froth up and froth up and froth up. And each time it froths up, it's getting closer to the end point. So what I want to do is I want to pull it before that happens and I want to finish it on the stove. I can finish it on here, but it's really hard to monitor what's going on because I can't actually see what's happening and I need to visually inspect it. And if I'm going to go to, uh, to sugar, I need to be really, 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 really careful. I need to be able to take it off and stir it. I'll talk more about that when I get to that point. But for now, uh, I think we're almost through. I'm going to boil down as much as I possibly can without risking ruining it because that'll mean far less moisture in my house. Uh, they a lot of people will recommend not doing it in their house for that reason because it produces so much moisture and some of the sugar actually does escape it ends up on the wall and it gets up you know sticky walls and all that business last night we let the sap run on coals and what we were left with is about that much in the pail so that is not very much next up we're going to filter what we have here we should have filtered it before we started but it was frozen block solid so you can't filter then we're just going to run it through a cloth here we're going to collect it in. I'm going to boil on three pots. I've got one big pot here, two smaller pots on all the elements. We're going to boil that down until it turns into syrup. And I think actually this time we're going to go to sugar. So it's going to take a little while. We've got to get the concentration down up around like almost 100% sugar, right? So we've got to boil off the rest of the water. It's much easier to do it uh, in a controlled environment, such as on a stove, because once it gets to the point where it's just about to sugar, it can go really quickly, spoil, burn, and it's done. Totally ruined. No good for nothing. So to illustrate this point, I know most, a lot of you people are not going to go out and collect sap and boil to make syrup. So this is not like survival, but I want to show you that it's not survival. To do this in a survival situation, so to speak, or wilderness living scenario, it's not very feasible. Home setting, yes, but not wilderness living. Uh, it's way too energy intensive. I mean, if you have a fire going, you have somebody sitting by a fire, you have a good cast iron pot, you can supplement some of your calories with it yeah for sure you can add some sugar you know you're getting two percent sugar by volume sometimes up to four or five percent depending on the tree that's added calories for sure if you want to use that instead of water for making a stew absolutely definitely beneficial if you want to drink it instead of water for sure but as far as making syrup and sugar it's not something that's entirely feasible until you had the advent of cast iron so native americans didn't actually do this until europeans came here and bought the cast iron pots and pans and then they could actually boil in giant cauldrons and they had a fire going for cooking anyway, so it was efficient.
but it's, but before Europeans arrived with the cast iron, it was totally unfeasible to do it. And then they started doing it in mass. And basically what they did, they did it not for calories. They did it because they could trade with Europeans for things of value like uh, more cast iron, guns, ammunition, etc. Things that made their lives actually easier to live. You know, and the metal traps were definitely something they were after. And they traded a lot of the furs and stuff just to get more metal traps because they were far more efficient than what they were using beforehand. This is why you should filter beforehand. You can see all the leftover or wood particles and dirt and chunks in there. So before you even start to boil in ideal conditions, you would filter that out first. Okay, so you can see this is starting to froth up right now. So this is the time you have, really have to start paying attention to your maple syrup. It's almost finished. See at the back here, it's all liquidy and it'll boil like that for a few hours. You can see also, I'll show you over here on this side. This is not, this is mostly liquid still, <clears throat> not syrup. But what happens is over time, it's going to start. You see, I stirred it and it went back down. What's going to happen is going to go up, back down, up, back down as I stir it. So it's not there yet. But when it goes up and it stays up, that's when you know it's finished and it's actually syrup. You can also do, do this with a, a thermometer and there's a set temperature which it reaches and when it's done. We're not going to do it with a thermometer, we're just going to do it by, by uh, art, by craft. The maple syrup craftsman. You can see this one actually just started foaming up here now. So you got to start watching this now. So if we can knock it down, it's not ready yet. Oh, it's going to go here. We've got to be careful. We don't want it to overflow either. So we're going to remove it from the heat a little bit. Turning, turning this into sugar is an interesting thing because in order for it to be sugar, it implies that there's 0% water or nearly 0% water. So you have to boil all of that liquid off. Now if it's syrup, it's nearly 0% water. But what happens if you go too long is it crystallizes. So it goes beyond the point where it's a liquid and it starts turning into a crystal, which is essentially what you're doing when you're turning it into sugar. You're turning it into a crystallized form and eliminating all the water. So this is gonna to continue to boil up and down until it's almost 100% done. You can use a thermometer, like I said, but we're gonna do this by eyeball. And we can do this as many times as we want. There's no risk here. The only risk we have right now is of burning it. So we can take it off the heat, we can stir it around and we can see if it solidifies. Once it's done properly, 100% of the water will be removed and it will turn into a, it's really neat process and it will turn directly into a sugar right in front of our eyes. It's really cool to watch. So this is almost at the point I would say right now that it's probably syrup. You can see it's holding the bubble. I don't want it to go over here. It's holding that bubble now consistently. So there's a good chance right now it's finished as far as the syrup. So I want to keep going with this as long as possible. The one at the back is almost there too. What I want to do is be able to combine the whole thing, take it off the heat and stir it really fast to let the rest of that moisture escape. All right, as you can see, I've totally overfilled it. I tried to combine both pots together Gave me some trouble here. We're gonna to try to get all the sugar back in the bowl. We're at that point where things are a little bit of a crisis. None of this is gonna to go to waste. I'm sure my son is gonna eat it. We wanna release the rest of that moisture. Knock the sides down while we can before it all hardens up. Ooh, there it goes. You see that steam wants to come out, but all that water. If it doesn't completely come out, it is possible to put it in a bowl overnight spread it out as you can see it didn't come out perfectly there's big chunks here there's still some moisture in it oh, all over the floor there's some moisture in there still 
But uh, what I'll do is I'll take the potato masher and I'll work the way, work them down and I'll just leave them exposed to the air and that'll finish it up. Okay, right, so I'm done. I managed a fairly big pot of sugar for all our work. What do you think about that? How does it smell in here? Like candy in the whole house. The whole house smells like candy? Yeah. It should. So most of it's a fine powder. Well, I say most of it. Half of it's fine powder on the top, like a brown sugar consistency. I'll work this down some more. Uh, there are some big blobs of uh, sugar. That just means there's a little bit more moisture left and kind of stuck together. But I can uh, work this down with a fork. Just keep uh, pounding it down until it ends up being a fine powder. But that can be used as is like that. It just may not have a, as long a shelf life because it has a little bit of moisture in there. You want to try some? Show them. Love it. <laughs> what does it taste like? Candy sugar, candy sugarish stuff. <laughs> Does it taste like a little bit of maple flavor, right? Maple <laughs> flavored candy, like you would predict syrup to taste. It was a candy. So there you go, start to finish. Maple syrup, maple sugar. Good? Yeah. A couple months ago, a couple YouTubers, Lucas and Bennett from Wilder Life, messaged me and they said they wanted a shout out and I said shout outs don't work like that. So you just can't ask for a shout out and expect to have much of an impact. What you need to do is something special. So I gave them a little bit of time and they came up with what I think is a really great promotion for their channel and it explains to my viewers, you guys, how they were impacted by my channel. So the idea is to pay it forward. I've talked to several YouTubers now that I'm a little bit bigger but one of the ones before I was anybody on YouTube was Sean Woods he uh, he actually gave me a shout out because I asked for one and so I'm paying that forward right now with the shout out to the Wilder Life so go check those guys out we're gonna play there a little bit after I'm through here but I also want to shout out a couple other guys that have been asking for for uh, shout outs for a while uh, one of them is Aaron Nelson he does lots of catch and cook fishing type videos so go check him out Riverbend Longbows Ray Fletcher and Boggy Creep Beast. He's uh, not super active, but he, he did help me out quite a bit with the hand drill and bow drill fires and stuff like that. So I would consider them to be very good YouTube friends of mine. And of course I'm missing lots of people, but uh, you know, I always mention Jeremy, One Wild Crafter, but those are the guys that I think deserve some support uh, for the time being. And people are always asking for shout outs and I can't shout everybody out obviously because I'll end up being a big commercial for things that maybe you're not totally interested in and I think YouTube is kind of merit-based if you produce good content people will subscribe and watch so without further further ado let's go uh, check out what Wilder Life has to offer and maybe I'll give them a sub at the time of this video's filming they had 280 subs so let's see where what a shout out can do for them Hey guys, guys, we, we are, are Wild Alive. I am Bennett. And I'm Lucas. We want to thank the Bit Woodsman for giving us the opportunity to share our channel with his community. You inspired us for making YouTube videos because we started watching your series, The Wilderness Living Challenge. And have ever since never stopped watching. So we grabbed our camera, went outside, and started making our own outdoor content. So, so that's, that's why we created. Wilder life. In the summer, I traveled to Costa Rica, in which I shot tons of videos. I encountered some of the most incredible animals. I had a face-to-face -face encounter with a spectacled caiman, tarantula, eyelash vipers, and even basilisks. I saw a black bear. I called a water moccasin and a green iguana, and at the end, a 13-feet bull shark. We recently went to Uganda, where we saw the likes of elephants, leopards, we call a flag-tilled centipede and even a juvenile black mamba. So we want to thank you once again for promoting our channel to your community. And we hope to see some of you guys soon on our channel. So, so as always, we're out here searching for wildlife, living the wilder life.
27. What are you going to do with those? I'm going to bring them to school and I'm going to share them with my class. So you're going to give those out to your friends? Yeah. And they're going to like them? Probably. Can you walk?